Okay. So next up uh, is our service transformation deep dive with uh, the Electrolux team. Um, so uh, I'm going to let each of you introduce yourself, if you don't mind. Um, Anna, let's start with you. Ladies first. First, thanks for having me, first of all. Thanks, Sarah, for inviting. Uh, uh, my name is Anna. Uh, I work for Electrolux for over two years now and I serve as a product domain expert in service operation. Uh, but during the project that we're going to tell soon about you, um, I was uh, the glue or the translator, as I like to call myself, between the IT and business, specifically for service operation domain. So yeah, hope to tell you more today about some lesson learned, some valuable insights about the project in Denmark. Yes. Hello, my name is Peter Sankvist. I'm a transformation manager at uh, Electrolux. So I have a small project team that is working with digitalization, transformation, change management projects for our contact center and uh, field service operation teams in the Nordics. And in the project we'll talk about today, I was the project manager from, from business side. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. And Christopher, I am... Um, my background is actually um, in sales initially, so from an end user perspective, using a CRM, but then moved to the other side of the CRM before joining this role five years ago, also working with um, rollouts of field service management tools. Thank you very much. And me and my team, we're sitting in an ivory tower uh, in the global headquarters, guessing how our software should be used and creating visions around it. And um, I will come back to that one. <laughs> I'm sure no one here can identify. Um, okay. All right. So, so in this session, we're going to sort of hear um, each perspective on uh, Electrolux's ongoing um, service transformation. Uh, so, so Christopher, um, Start by just sort of giving a bit of history, context, background, and we'll go from there. All right. Uh, a long time ago, 2018, in a country far, far away, Belgium, we went live with a pilot, CRM and FSM tool combined. And um, just after a few weeks, it, it turned out, actually, we saw more and more signs. Um, actually that, that the FSM solution didn't work properly. Fit for purpose. And honestly, if we are to look inwards as well, I don't think we, we, we created uh, the, the business requirements well enough from our side. So it was one, one, one part was a vendor, one part was definitely on our side as well. And... Just a few weeks before go live, the vendor announced that they acquired another FSM company, which they said that they would go for long term. Uh, so it was anyway, just a few weeks before go live, it was uh, basically, uh, I mean, we would anyway have to switch one day. So the Belgian business suffered quite uh, dramatically at the time, um, and it was decided to replace the FSM side of it. But this time we thought, let's do something different. Let's, let's involve the, the, the actual, the end users and all the countries that would ever use this tool should be part of even selecting the vendor, selecting the tool. So we, we took a completely new approach to all of that. And before we even sat down to, to, to write down the first business requirement, we actually had the first. The, the, the first step was to invite all the potential vendors, six of them at the time, for a day each to present the future of a field service, as we called it. So what could field service look like in Electrolux or in general in the future? Because what we wanted to avoid was to basically just write down how we are working today, leave that over to a vendor and just have a new interface of the current processes, right? That was the end game. They all came, they all kept presented, and we basically flew everyone in uh, all countries into Stockholm. We locked 
ourselves in, in a room for, for weeks, more or less. And we wrote the business requirements word by word on a, on a big screen like this together. And was it time efficient? Definitely not. But was it, was it a, a glue to, to have the, 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 all the stakeholders aligned? to do this together, even to, to fight over simple words or simple sentences of, of how we should write things, definitely. It, it, I would say that it paid off multiple times in that sense. And we had very tough discussions also with, um, with, with the, the, the local stakeholders. One big uh, discussion I remember was, for example, can we even trust an optimization engine? Can we even trust a route, uh, a system doing routes for us? We, we manually planned our routes for, for forever. We, we cannot trust a system or, or, I mean, mobile. The technicians will never go mobile. They have their, their, their laptops. Discussions like that in front of every business stakeholder. I mean, it was tough there and then, but I think we came out of there stronger, basically. It tells a little bit of where we came from also. Uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yes. definitely. I mean, we, we created the, the requirements together. Uh, we, I mean, it, it could also serve as a vision, more or less, because we combined the assist with also a, a little bit with the to be. So we also grouped it in ways that you can actually see um, where we will go in short term, but also a little bit where we aim to go in the future with the predicted uh, spare parts as an example. We gave it to the vendors, we discussed back and forth, of course, and then we actually went for a couple of reference visits to go and meet the actual customers already using the software. A little bit of a Gemba walk. You could, we could interview them, we can actually see the system in place. I don't know, Peter, do you have anything to add on that one? No, but first I can add um, on the requirement part. I think we made it clear to us that yes, we wanted to see what the different vendors were offering and how, how their you know, roadmap looked like. And we draw a lot of inspiration from that, which was then included in our, in our requirements. Uh, but we also knew that we wanted to have a, a vendor you know, that we could work with where you know, they could inspire us continuously as well. And now coming to the, to, 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 to the, the customer reference meetings, I think it was very important, and, and we will touch upon this uh, later in, in another segment. But uh, to me, remembering that time, it's been a, a couple of years, but remembering that time, I think it was very important for us to see um, the solution live and, and to also see, um, to talk with the people using them, asking them what is working, etc. Also without having the vendor standing, you know, behind their shoulder. Now, Marcus said he was standing behind the uh, but, but uh, yeah, no, it, it, it was really great. Yes, yes. I remember it uh, well. It was also a hectic period, but, you know. Yes, so what we did in the end was basically to, actually together, also with the business, to create the evaluation criteria. So not us centrally guessing evaluation criteria. We did them together. And, and every country had the same weight. Uh, and, and we calculated the averages from there. Of course, we also involved architects or, or IT. Even, even vendor management or the, the contractual side of it. But it was all transparent and, and everyone was, was um, I mean, every, every voice was, was equally heard, so to say. And we took our decision and, and, and we also focused already then before even having started to build something for what's in it for me. What's in it for me as an end user? What's in it for me as a technician? What's in it for me as a resource planner? What, so we also try to, to a little bit to group our vision or our business requirements into already then to say what's in it for, for, for our technicians, as an example. So essentially starting the change management project from the very beginning exactly. because you're thinking about how to personalize the value of the project to each individual function. Exactly. So what we did, uh, we replaced the system in Belgium then, finally, and, and then we basically moved on to Denmark, which we are here to deep dive a little bit into. Okay. All right. So, so Peter, um, get us up to speed on, on Denmark, okay? And then we're going to talk about uh, some of the, the biggest lessons learned. First, 
I will just shortly introduce then. So what me and Anna will, will talk about now and present and, 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 and share some details on uh, is a project that we basically came out from this summer. We will try to follow the timeline uh, also of the project. So the goal I was this summer uh, and, and uh, the project was roughly one, one year. Uh, and yes, to set the stage also, I think it's important to, to, to a little bit present what our Danish service organization was. So we had a ver very stable service organization. Um, we had the highest average age of technicians in, in Europe as well. Um, a lot of people that has been working for a long time in the company. Uh, everyone is experts. Uh, it's almost like a small family company uh, where we visited. And they're working on a 40-year-old tool, field service management tool. We have been using for 40 years. So the IT landscape is also an old one. So this is just to set the stage uh, of the challenge that, that was ahead of us, which you can imagine had a lot of, due to, lot of, lot of it was due, uh, related to change management. And one of the first things that we did was the mobilization. So we had to set up a team of people there in Denmark that will support to roll out the project in our da Danish sales company. Uh, and this is even before the project really starts. And one thing that we decided to do there uh, was to take someone from outside of the service organization. So you already know that I have people that has a lot of process knowledge. They've been working for a long time. They know everything. Yet we decided to put a person from outside of the service organization in a very important leading role. And the idea behind this is he was a change driver, a change ambassador. He also didn't, I mean, to a certain degree, having all that old process knowledge, you have, that's like having heavy luggage mm -hmm. on your back. Mm -hmm. And he did not have that. Mm -hmm. So he could work with a free mindset and it allowed him to also move very fast. Uh, so this is, uh, and, and today, this is fun. Today he has an important role in our service organization, both support in Denmark, but also on a Nordic level. It's, so, good. it's good to know he survived. He survived. <laughs> he did. He did. Yeah. I'm glad he's still, he's still around. He, yeah, he made it he through. He's still around. Okay. And, and now he has an important uh, role, yes, to continue to support our, our service organization. Yes. Oh, also, this, would, this, this could be inspiration or something to think about if anyone here is in a project where you're about to set up a team, you know, who do you put in that project team to lead this change? Uh, especially now when I mentioned the background of, of, of Denmark and, mm -hmm. and all the change management that was needed. Uh, and uh, so this was before the project started. Then we decided uh, one thing and uh, before we even had the kickoff, we decided that we wanted to go all of us together, so me, Anna, the Danish team, also the project, the, 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 the central business team, uh, to go down to Belgium to see each other face to face. Now, today, post-COVID, we know that we can do these type of projects, you know, over teams and, and, and we can do it online. And uh, I have done another project like this completely online because it happened to be during uh, the COVID period, but I would like to stress, uh, you know, the importance of actually being able to see each other face to face. And it's something that we should, you know, we should not underestimate this. And, um, see here. Yes. So we went there and one very important thing here is this was the opportunity for my team, then the Danish team, to be able also to see the solution working and to talk with the people who are using it today. So we got to talk with the technicians, with the resource planners, the parts planners, the back office team, and uh, ask any questions we wanted. They presented to us. And this specifically built confidence in the Danish team that lasted a full year. Mm -hmm. They knew that the solution was working for them, so then it should work for us. And that I saw hands on, you know, that actually built confidence for, for the full year. Here I have a, 
another funny story that we had a team building activity also in Belgium. And um, I asked my counterpart in Belgium, because the service operation manager in Denmark, he really wanted to have Belgium fries. He had heard about the Belgium fries. So we talked to her and, and, and she said, okay, you have to go to this, uh, this place. We went there in the afternoon. It was closed. Okay, uh, we go somewhere else. And then the next day we told her it was closed. Okay, but go to this place. We went there in the afternoon. It was also closed. So I, I, I called her up. Looked, and how, what can we do? Because now we have really hyped up the Belgian fries. So the next day we actually had a chef that came there. And we together got to do the Belgian fries. And already there as a team building activity, we split it up in different groups. So one person got to cut the fries, someone else, uh, you got to fry them. We had to go in the, out in the parking lot to fry them. <laughs> so 32 degrees. 32 degrees in the parking lot <laughs> frying it. And, and, and another guy from the team salted them. And I had the most important role with, uh, that was to taste them. Yes, no. of course. No, uh, so that again, I think I want to stress that importance now, especially in the post-COVID period, to actually see each other face-to-face uh, and do not underestimate, uh, underestimate that. Anna, how was this experience for you? I absolutely agree with you, Peter. I think the visit in Belgium was useful, not only for meeting face-to-face and for boosting confidence, but also from an IT perspective, because it was uh, really the first time for our business stakeholder to get acquainted with the, with the new solution. And um, also here, it, as Peter already mentioned, um, it was uh, the time in which our uh, Belgian colleagues proved to be very good ambassador for this new technology. And we all know that uh, a positive review from a satisfied customer is definitely more convincing than just me talking about how cool these new functionalities are, right? And uh, in this uh, context of the visit in Belgium, it was time for officially kicking off the, the project. And uh, I think you said it, Sarah, and Caroline, you repeated once again, and uh, I will say one more time, just to reiterate the message. I really want to emphasize the importance of storytelling, um, because uh, we, we really need to make sure to explain all the our business user why we're doing this change, of course, but also the consequence of not embracing this change. So basically, what's the opportunity cost at stake? Um, and also maybe another important thing would be, for example, to explain the our business colleagues not only the, the value of this all new software implementation that we will be doing, uh, in terms of generic uh, company gains, like cutting costs, for instance, uh, but also take some time to explain the, the values of this new survey transformation project in terms of uh, tangible benefits. So, so make sure that you explain to, uh, to all these uh, agents uh, that will work with the solution what's, what's in there for them. So how will these new tools make their life easier and better? I don't know, for example, you can say uh, how these new tools will uh, reduce really the amount of time they have been doing just repetitive and, and boring tasks. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, okay, once we have uh, finalized um, um, the kickoff and we really got the buy-in from all the people involved in the project, uh, it was time for move forward for the next uh, stage, of the, for the next phase of the project, which is the discovery phase. Uh, and here again, we're trying to follow the, the uh, timeline of the project so that we can really uh, make you feel, uh, um, yeah, uh, hear our story. Um, but the discovery phase, what's there? What's the meaning? So the objective is really to understand all the user's need and uh, design all the project requirements accordingly. And uh, of course, the outcome of this analysis is to uh, make sure that we understand the project scope and also its limitation. So both from the business side, so Peter's side, and also from my side, the, uh, let's say, more IT side. And uh, um, before uh, letting the, um, you know, asking Peter more about his uh, experience on the discovery phase, or if you want Sarah to, to kick in some question, I just would like to reiterate uh, what we have been doing in Denmark uh, the past year. 
what we have been doing is a kickoff, I want to say a rollout project. Um, and with the rollout project, we mean um, that we have a standard blueprint solution and then uh, we simply transition this solution to many different countries. And this was the case of Denmark, of course. Uh, but at the same time, really, we really need to make sure that we are in line with all the business processes, uh, but also we are compliant with local regulation. Easy, right? Well, uh, it was uh, it was obviously challenging, uh, and uh, I would like to to remind once again what uh, Peter very quickly uh, while setting up the stage and talking about the context. Users in Denmark have been working with the same system for over 40 years. So so they really were able to operate with it blindly. And uh, um, I really want to to picture it for you. So imagine you have this back office uh, uh, guy sitting in uh, Frederica in the office in, uh, in Denmark. And they were able to, you know, like plan the technician route for the entire uh, week while simultaneously picking up the phones, answering some emails and also drinking a cup of coffee. Yeah. So now... Uh, what's next? Well, uh, we kick in uh, and uh, of course it was quite a service transformation project and um, uh, I'll, I'll try to speed up. But what I want to say is just to bring up one practical example of what could happen during discovery phase. Um, so users and our uh, local counterparts in Denmark have been used to navigate the screen uh, with simple keyboards commands. So um, um, they basically didn't even know what a mouse is. They knew what a mouse was. Da, 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 da. But the animal. <laughs> and they had a lot. They knew what a mouse was, yeah. Okay. But, but, but you are right, it, it was a... But what I want to say is that instead, our solution was then definitely point and click. So... It was really mouse based, mm -hmm. and uh, this shift from keyboard to mouse uh, that was a detail that was absolutely overlooked by our IT teams actually became a source of concern for our business. So here, I really want to uh, give you this example to make you think that um, what could be some red flags uh, that could you know arose from legacy system and legacy thinking. So, yeah, I think uh, uh, that was it from the discovery phase. But before handing over, I would like to mention one success factor that I can really recommend. Uh, it's uh, we implement what we call the plug and play session, which is uh, basically some session in which we grant to all the users the access to the system so they could play with it. And these happened well before our uh, technical team uh, even initiated the system configuration. So it was really a good occasion for stimulating early feedback uh, from between IT and the, the business counterparts. And also, yeah, so for the business to get the first, you know, hands-on uh, experience. So, very good. Yes. And, and um, to build on that... Uh, I think it was something great that we that that we did because uh, you, you know you you get you you get to see a lot of powerpoints and you have a process discussions and and you might see some demo or some some video but to already start to be able to 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 play around you 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 get that it makes the training much easier mm -hmm. later on when you have to so so I think that was a good addition to to how we how we did this project you mentioned discovery where we learned about each other. So you learned about the Danish uh, team and uh, we learned about the new processes. After this, IT was starting with the build and, and the com configurations for everything that was captured in, in, in Denmark. And while that happened, we had a period called change impact assessment uh, period in the project for the business. What do we do there? Well, we were planning, uh, doing a lot of planning, uh, you know, both on who should do what and when, but, but also on how we should do communication, who should we communicate to, how should we communicate, also in training. So how should we do the training? Is it face-to-face? -face? Is it one of our training tools? Uh, we try to look at all different areas within, within the, our service organization 
see what needs were needed there. Uh, it can also be, you know, that roles can change now. So someone who was sitting there tabbing and using the F buttons, uh, no, 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 now there might be, be, be something else that needs to be added or, or removed in that kind of role. So this is what we did. And here that leads me to preparation and planning. So you need to have a plan A and you need to have a plan B when you do these things and you need to plan carefully. But while doing all this planning, you also need to make sure that you are prepared for the unknown. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that? Well, you have to make sure that you are resilient and that you can also build resilience within your team. So planning is key, yes, but there will happen things that you did not plan for and then you don't want to freak out. Then you want to have a team around you that can, you know, uh, you know, you fall down. You, okay, what? We pick ourselves up again fast and we just tackle it. And one example of this, um, let's, it'll make Anna start sweating. You probably tried to forget it. But two days before the go live, uh, one of our processes, uh, we realized, uh, or my colleagues in IT realized, it will not work. So what we have trained people in, in that process, it will simply not work. We have to figure out another way for, to, to do that. And then by, 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 uh, by having everything planned accordingly and everything else running, we had space to actually deal with that. Um, so that, um, yeah, make sure that while doing all the planning, also spread resilience within your team so that if, when the unknown happens, you can, you can, um, you can deal with it. So we did this planning, planning, planning. IT was doing the build. Do you have anything to share from the build phase? I do. Uh, I'll be quicker this time, oh. promise. Uh, I think from one of the most challenges that we have uh, faced during the build phase uh, is how to strike the balance between standardization and customization. Uh, so here it's, uh, it's really important to remember that we have been doing a rollout project. So what does it mean? Again, uh, we want to achieve the maximum amount uh, of standardization while allowing for just some process deviation. But of course, during the course of the project, we came to realization that our template solution could not fully address all the business requirements. So it was obviously uh, a challenge. So here, my suggestion and, and lesson learned is trying to find the middle ground. So uh, of course, uh, and here I, I I would like to talk especially to my IT colleagues sitting in the room here is don't, you know, don't just focus on the uh, one size fits all uh, approach because it will not work, but also don't over promise like crazy customization that we all know that we are going to regret it because then we have to maintain it. So, you know, uh, find the, find the middle ground and do some compro. Up to you. Up to me. Oh. Now we're getting closer to the go live and uh, it, it is time now to, uh, for Anna and, and the IT team and the, and the central business team to actually train uh, my team so that they, the, 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 key, the, the project team to train them uh, so that they later on can, can train our end users, contact center agents and, and technicians. And it's also time for us to do the, the, the testing. So functionality build specifically for Denmark also needs to be tested. And we choose to call this period trade and test. And, uh, and uh, it, yeah, it's really about uh, making sure that my team has the knowledge to be able to create the material and, and, and train, no, train all the agents, back office and everything so that, so that we can be ready. And here... We have a learning to share something that we ran into, which I think you can talk a little bit more about. I do. Uh, it's what I refer to as the lost in translation. So we mm -hmm. all know that uh, IT and business, we don't speak the same language, not mm -hmm. at all. And here I'm not uh, referring to that, uh, you know, Peter talk uh, um, Swedish, our local counterparts speaks Danish and our developers talk Python or Java. No, what I mean is that we really need to make sure 
Do not leave any space for annoying misunderstanding. So make sure that all the communication is crystal clear. So, for example, uh, if your company is following the agile methodologies, make sure that you spend some time with this business and you really explain what is a, a uh, you know, what is a sprint planning, what is a scrum master, and uh, what's actually the process of uh, reporting a, a back in uh, in Jira. So, yeah, uh, don't give for granted that we we can understand each other. Oh, good. And, um, or after that we went live uh, and it worked. <laughs> Not everything as well as we would have wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, but we managed to repair our consumers' broken appliances at the time that we had promised them. Uh, you know, we were lifting all of the job from the old tools, all the, all the, all the promises into the new tools, and, and we managed to do that. So in that sense, it, it, it was a success. Um, and when you're in these projects, and I've been in a few ones, I, I, I lost count. Uh, but you need to take some time to stop and reflect. What could we have done better? What, uh, you know, you need to reflect on what could I have done better? What learnings do I take with me? And when you're on this journey and you're in a small team and you work together, it can be tough sometimes, right? And you're working towards deadlines all the time. And, and, uh, uh, and you have that goal in front of you. I think it is important to remember to yourself to stop once in a while, also with the team and, and everyone involved and, and uh, work a little bit on the storytelling to remind it, each other, you know, and, and yourself, you know, why are we doing this? And uh, this is the greatest transformation project that, that Electrolux probably is doing, that, that we are in here. And as I said, we're replacing a 40 year old field service management tool. That is not easy. Uh, and in that sense, we're writing a bit of history here, uh, while doing this. So what I'm trying to say is that you also in this need to then stop and, and also make sure that you have a bit of fun. Mm -hmm. And this also comes from, from experience, but, but a laugh here and there along the way it can really be the difference between you taking a step forward or staying where you are. Mm -hmm. So remember to have fun if you're in one of these uh, projects. That, that, is, uh, that is important. Oh. Mm. And that uh, wraps up. We managed to talk about the full project uh, timeline here and uh, share some, some, some learnings. Oh. Yeah. I think the last point is is a really good one in the sense of, you know, I, I spoke this morning about change leadership versus change management and the idea that, you know, we're today in a constant state of change, continual improvement, continual innovation. And I think without pausing to celebrate the wins and have some fun and and allow that to energize you for the next phase, you know, that's where that change fatigue you know, comes in, right? You need to make sure that you, you know, acknowledge the hard work that's happened. You celebrate the successes you've had and, and then, you know, regroup and, and push forward. So. And also, I mean, if you don't do that, if you don't do that, then you can also end up feeling that you haven't done anything mm -hmm. or accomplished anything mm -hmm. while you actually have. So, so yes. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Well, I say job well done uh, to, to you both. And uh, Christopher, what, what happens next? What does the future hold? Uh, a lot of things. Um, <laughs> no, I don't, uh, I don't have one answer on that one. Uh, I, 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 th there are so many things to look at and, and to investigate and to analyze that I don't really know where to start. But one could, I heard a word called AI somewhere <laughs> and apparently that's going to be a big thing and i mean just imagine how that would change our 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 entire business model actually i think um so we have a, a chatbot today um i mean you wouldn't really need that because you, you would go to your ai assistant so to say so we're actually taking that contact away from electrolux moving into the the um, the AI assistant, whether that is in the phone or, or sitting on our shoulders, I don't know. But, but 
And the same thing really with contact center. Why even call a contact center agent when you can ask your 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 um, AI assistant to book directly or or troubleshoot and if necessary book a technician. And what does that mean? I mean, uh, and also as a next step for our service technicians, likely I would say that they go out to less jobs since the consumer would solve more by their own because it's cheaper. Either by solving it without spares or even sending them a spare that the AI assistants also can explain how, how they would even mount it. But I also expect our service technicians to do more than just repairing white goods, actually. If you think about it, the app is an extension now of our, of, of our refrigerator. So, so they need to be able to, to also repair the app if needed. And, and also, of course, in the, if the Wi-Fi uh, at home is, is, is not working properly, he will also get a question around that. It's usually a he, by the way, as of now, at least. But I can also see that, that, that um, I mean, why not have the flexibility in our routes and in our schedules and in also our technicians' knowledge, of course, with the help of their AI assistant, so to say, to repair other things and just the, the, the refrigerator while you're anyway in someone else's home. So I can also see us broadening that in the future. When this will come, I have no idea. But I mean, th though I, I think we will, um, we will redefine what an Electrolux refrigerator technician will be doing in, in, in just five years with, with all of this. Um, um, and what, and what is the tool of tomorrow? Are you maybe having it yeah. who, who right knows? now? You know, so the, the, mm. the, the main tool uh, today, it's the app. What is it tomorrow? Exactly. And, and we're moving away. I mean, and, and who, who would even answer a question? So say that the AI assistant is, is, is ad, uh, I mean, advising wrongly about our appliances. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we don't even know own that conversation. And the technician will likely, once he arrives, likely get questions around that as well, right? Mm -hmm. So, so the, I, I, I mean, the, the, I think the, we're expanding the, the scope of a technician dramatically going forward. I think going back to what I said this morning about the uh, chat I had over lunch at the event um, a few weeks ago, you know, the questions you're asking yourself about what does the future hold are are the same questions a lot of companies are asking themselves right now, right? Which is, okay, what does this mean to our business? What, you know, yes, what does the future hold? But what are the next steps as well, right? And I think, you know, one of the the points here is that whatever those steps look like, it would have been impossible to accomplish on a forty year old service management system, right? So I think that the phase, you all are in is the phase a lot of folks are in, which is modernizing your foundational technologies in a way that allows you to be ready to continually innovate, you know, from that point forward and and figure that out as you go along and as things become clear. Go ahead. And now also, that's on the technology side, mm -hmm. but now we also have, uh, now the people is also more ready for Yes. It. Yes. So, so, so now the, the, the people is more ready for the changes and fast changes. Yeah. So we have the foundation now for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And you've built trust, right? I mean, going through that process, you mentioned, Christopher, at the beginning, the, the failed pilot and the learning you had, right? Um, taking that as an opportunity to do things completely differently, to involve the, the right people from the beginning, to build that trust with them. You know, you mentioned uh, Denmark, the region with the uh, highest average age of technician, the most experience with a 40 year old system. That's daunting. Uh, and, you know, they have made it through uh, and, and they're adjusting. And, and that means that you did a great job of, you know, helping them through that transition. But going through all of that together builds trust. Um, for the the next layer of change right so um yeah very good do you uh have something uh, more i think that do you I? can uh, share <laughs> no but when we talk about technology and people uh if i have to pick up one of the 
most important lesson learned, um, I would say that, uh, and again, I'm referring uh, a lot to my IT colleagues here, remember that it's uh, the end, it's not an IT project, right? It's, uh, it's a people project. Uh, so whenever, especially just before go live, when everybody turns crazy and tense, um, we, we all rush to make sure that we are uh, setting up the, the landscape to make sure that it's ready for production. Uh, but of course, most of the time, technology is rushing ahead of people. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and we don't really realize that uh, our user community is lagging behind. So, yeah, always just pause for a little. Mm -hmm. and Absolutely.